then we deserve to be blessed. God is good to us, and God is great in our lives. Amen. If you will, turn in your Bibles today to James chapter 4, verse number 1. And as you uh, turn there, if you will, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. James chapter 4, verse number 1. James chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We pray, God, that you would help us today to see the necessity that we need to give everything over to you, Lord. God, that we don't need to hold anything back for ourselves or try to be in control and try to do the things. But, Lord, we need to give everything to you. And when we do, it makes the world a difference. Lord, we can go from death to life when we give things to you. We can go from turmoil to peace. We can go from sorrow and depression to fullness of joy when we turn to you, Lord. And we just thank you, God, that we have that privilege, that you are right right there, right here willing to receive us, willing to accept us, willing that if we will repent, that you will turn our lives completely around. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, for us that are believers, God, that you are willing that if we stray, that you would say, come, and we can come back to you, Lord, that we can find that peace and we can find that safety and we can find that rest in you, Lord. And I pray, God, that if there's anyone uh, here today, if there's anyone watching by social media or however, God, that you would speak to us today and turn us directly to you so that we will give all to you, Lord. You gave all for us. Lord, help us to give all to you. And we praise you and ask God for your help and your anointing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can be seated. So we conclude today the series that I've been speaking with of giving giving that makes the difference and we'll conclude today with the simple thought of giving all when we think of all all is not 99 percent is it it's not partial i'm going to give this but i'm going to hold this back for myself or i'm going to give this and then i'll take it back and no it's a hundred percent and it's releasing it When you give something, you give it completely and you release it. It's no longer yours. We no longer have control over it. We no longer have the say over it. We no longer have the authority of it. For example, if a person gives you a gift, that gift now becomes owned 100% by the person who received it. Not 99%. Not things that, that... Oh, I'll give it to you if. But when we give it to someone, we give it to them completely. And no longer do we have control of it. If it's money and we give it to somebody, she or he can spend it however they choose to spend it. When it's no longer do we have any say over it, so it belongs to the other person, and no longer can we say it has to be done my way. My way. And no longer do we have the authority over that gift. The right of ownership has transferred. 
and now it belongs to the person who has received it, and no longer are you in charge of it. When we give our lives to Jesus, we give him and we have to give him all. That means that we cannot give part of our lives to him and keep the rest for ourselves, but we have to give him 100% of everything. And by doing so, we release control. Now, that's a difficult thing for us as humans. And some humans have the makeup that's a little even more difficult to give up control. But we have to give up control. We have to surrender and we have to say, and and any say that's over it, we have to say, Lord, I've given you my life. I'm giving you all. You have the say. You have the control, and you have the authority to be the Lord in my life. See, there's a difference of being Lord and Savior. Jesus is Savior and Lord. Amen? That's what he wants to be. When he has this relationship with us, it's Savior and Lord. So he's not lo- no longer just our Savior, but he is our Lord of our lives. He has control, 100%. We've got to give it to him. He has the say over what we do and what we don't do, where we go and where we don't go, who we're with and who we're not with. He has the say because we've given our lives to him. He has the authority to tell us these things because he paid for us. For we've been bought with a price. We've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We were prisoners. We were in chains and bondage. But Jesus came and gave his blood and his life to ransom us and paid the ransom so that we could be free from the guilt and the shame and the sins that had us bound. And now we're alive in Christ and Christ is alive in us. We're dead to the old person that we were, and now we're alive in Christ Jesus. But do we always do that? As a believer, do we always give him 100%? Do we find a struggle going on from time to time? Do we war still from time to time uh, uh, that, that results in us trying to take back control? Oh, Lord, I give you everything, but wait a second. I need to take control of this because I think I've got it handled. I can do it. 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 Listen, you can do it, and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But in ourselves, in our taking the control, sorry, can't do it. Not going to be able to master it. Not going to be able to take control and and be able to to give the, the satisfaction and the peace and the joy that only comes from giving it over to Christ. So we struggle. And we want to have the say in things, and we want to try to be in charge still, and we want to rule in, 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 in everything, and we can't do that. And I think we all do that from time to time. I think we all have that tendency because we're still human. We still have that humanity that we have to struggle with and fight with. We still have the inner desire of, of that flesh that wants to do things to please the flesh. And some of those things are sinful things. And we still have those struggles. We still have those desires. And and, and some have learned to be more submissive in their walk with Christ, and some struggle with giving it all. And they find themselves in a place of being in constant turmoil. And today we want to look at the way that really, uh, to look at the way that really will make the most difference in our lives and for people around us, is when we give all. Turn to your neighbor there, if you will, please, and just tell them, we need to give all. We need to give all. Now, Webster defines struggle as being to make strenuous or violent efforts in the face of difficulties or opposition struggling with the problem. It also is to proceed with difficulty or with great effort. So struggling is fighting. It's a fight. James 4 verse 1 says, from whence come wars and fightings among you. So he's talking about that inner struggle. He's talking about that turmoil that sometimes is within us and that fight that we're fighting. 
The struggles happen as a result from us wanting to fulfill our inward desire or our lusts that we have to do what we want to do to satisfy the desire of our flesh. To do the things that the flesh wants to do. Now, when you're in a struggle, do you enjoy being struggling? Does anybody enjoy fighting? No. Does anybody enjoy being beat up sometimes? Does anybody enjoy just the effort and the, oh, 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 I'm fighting against this and I'm fighting against that and I'm fighting against this? No. I don't think anybody enjoys that, I don't believe. Do you enjoy being hurt and hurting others? Do you enjoy not being at real peace inside? Do you enjoy struggling? I think when it comes down to the truth of the matter, nobody really enjoys a struggle. We tend to like things to run smoothly. We want peace. Everybody just to get along. Everything to be just la, 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 la. Right? We want that ah feeling all the time. We like to have no conflict. We like when we don't have to deal with the drama. We like to be at peace. But when we give in to our lusts and we give in to those inner desires and we do it as a child of God in particular, there's a war going on inside you. And there will be a struggle that you're engaged in. Why is that? Well, when we give our lives to Jesus, we are to surrender, and we do surrender. And listen, you can't be saved. I don't believe you can be saved. I don't believe you can genuinely be saved without a full surrender over to Christ. I think you've got to give him 100%. And when you fully do that, guess what? He comes inside. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes and dwells inside of us. And when we give Him our lives, then we're saying, Lord, I give you everything. I give you control of my life. I give you the uh, uh, say over what we're to do and what I'm not to do. And, And I give you authority in my life. Now, some may think, well, that's terrible. That's awful. I don't want to have to live that kind of life. I don't want to live in bondage to Jesus. Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. <laughs> if that's what you think it is, you got it all messed up. Right. See, there's peace and joy in Christ. His way is not grievous. It's not burdensome. If we do it His way, it becomes a burden, it becomes grief, it becomes a struggle when we try to do it His way and our way at the same time. That's where the war comes. Boom, boom, boom. You see, Jesus is sitting there on the throne of our heart. His Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, and he's there, and he's always there. And he said he will never leave us nor forsake us, but he would abide with us forever. He's there. Even when we're tempted, even when we're struggling in our heart, even when we're struggling in our mind, even when we're dealing with conflict, even when lusts are rising up, even when temptation comes our way, Jesus is still there. His Holy Spirit is there. And so His ways are not burdensome ways. They're ways of life and peace. They're the right way of how that we've been designed to live. We don't get that sometimes. Sometimes we think that we're supposed to do it my way. It's supposed to be my way. And Jesus, if you want to help me along the way, come and help me. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. Oh, Jesus, you you rescue me in my trouble and save me in my trouble and then see you. It doesn't work that way. When you ask him to save you and you meant it from your heart, he's here with you. He dwells inside you. And everything you do now will be with the consciousness of his presence. (laughs) Wait a second, I used to not feel bad when I did this. Well, now I do because... The Holy Spirit is convicting us. 
His presence is there. The Holy Ghost, the Holy God is inside of us, and therefore unholy things are not welcome inside. Unholy actions, unholy unrighteous things are not welcome inside our lives anymore. And so the Holy Spirit says, wait a second, we've got to work on this one. We've got to work on this thing. We've got to work on this because this doesn't work. This, you're going to have a struggle and you're going to end up falling. You're going to have failures from this if we don't deal with it. So his ways are not grievous. He will lead us and guide us and he will protect us from evil. And he will protect us from ourselves. And he'll watch out for us and, and looking out for our best interest. He always has our best interest at heart. We just have to realize that. When he's saying, don't do this, it's for your best. When he's saying, I want you to do this, it's for your best. God's not sitting there saying, I want to see, let me see how, how miserable I can make people's lives. No. He's wanting to give us the solution to our problem. As we talked about last Sunday, Jesus is the solution to our sin problem. He wants to give us the solution. He wants to give us the, the, the answer and the help that we need and to be there and not only just to help us but to have a relationship with him that is, was once broken because of sin but now is made right because of Jesus. And if we'll trust him and obey him, it would be the best for us to do so. It's best to do what Father says to do. Amen? But we don't, we don't always do that. No, we don't. And we have times that we want to do what we want to do. And what happens is a spirit of rebellion strikes up inside of us. Joined with the spirit of pride that starts knocking on our doors. And the war begins. The struggle starts. I want to do this. I want to have my way. And Jesus says, no, that's harmful. I want to be with this person. And Jesus says, no, you'll get hurt. I want to go my own way. And Jesus says, no, you'll get lost and you'll go down the wrong path. And you'll make a lot of mistakes with a lot of regrets. Don't go that way. But I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, and a struggle is going on. Jesus is saying no, and we're saying yes, and boom, and boom, and boom, and boom, and boom, and the fight is going on. So you see the struggle, and, and what happens is we get mad. We get mad at God. And we get frustrated with him, and we're ready to give up on Jesus and serving God because we can't do what we want to do. And let's just say it, we can't continue to sin. That's it. Sin is not to reign in our mortal bodies anymore. It's not to have dominion in our lives. It's not to have the authority in our lives. Sin is not to be in charge anymore. Jesus is to be in charge Jesus is to be the king in our lives and the Lord of our lives. And the struggle is real when we want sin to be in charge and Jesus is already sitting on the throne. And sin comes and says, hey, I'm going to uproot you. And Jesus is like, no, you're not. And our lusts and our desires are saying, I want to take you off the throne. I want to put me back on the throne. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm going to fight for you. You're not going. As long as we keep that fight going on, Jesus is fighting for us. He's fighting for us. And the inner, inner struggle intensifies. And then we have a conflicted life. And we're fighting against God, and we're absolutely miserable. Verse 2 says, you lust and you have not. That's frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> you want it and you don't have it. Because there's God 
opposing it. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. And listen, when you do ask, you ask amiss. You're asking for the wrong things. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Not a matter of doing what God wants to do. You're doing it for your own satisfaction. As long as we fight against God, we're going to find ourselves miserable. Struggle is real and misery is real. Because there's that constant conviction of the Holy Spirit that's there with us. Holiness and unholiness clash every time. Sin and the righteousness of God clash every time. What happens when sin hits the righteousness and holiness of God? Wrath of God comes up because he hates sin. And, and then there's that conviction. And there's that wooing of the Spirit. Bidding us, don't do this. Don't do this. Stop doing this. It's harmful for you. But how many times do we override that? How many times do we grieve the Spirit of God? How many times have we made God, His Spirit, sad? Oh, if they would just have listened to me. Oh, if they would just have done, now look at the consequences. Now look at the, the situation they're in. I tried to warn them, and he's grieved. They lost things. He's grieved. And how many times do we grieve him? We're not to grieve him. We're not to do that, but we do. Lord, forgive me for the times that I've grieved your spirit. See, when we were sinners, we didn't think much about sinning. We didn't think about this being that wrong. If it felt good, do it. Had a bunch of friends that would hang out and do it too. People encourage you to do it. It was cool to do it. Didn't think anything about it. But then Jesus comes and we give all to him and, wait a second, things are not quite the same, are they? Now we're aware that sin is knocking at our door. Now we become aware that this is wrong. And this is right. And we would deal with the consequences of sin and the pain that it causes. And so as Christians, we have that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of us. And when we override him and we grieve him, we are absolutely miserable. If you will, turn to your neighbor there and tell them, miserable. Miserable. Why? Because we've been transformed, we've been changed. We're no longer the same person anymore. I was reading something that somebody had posted on social media yesterday about people being born a certain way and, and they can't help it and being born. And this thought came to me. Yeah, they were born this way. We're all born in sin. The thing about it, though, is we got to be born again. That's what's going to help the problem with sin is when we realize we got to be born again. We're all born in sin. Some have this sin, some have this sin, some have this sin, some have this sin. But we've got to be born again by the Spirit of God and get rid of that old way of living. And when we're born again and we continue to try to sin and live the old way, we're absolutely miserable. Amen? Somebody know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know what I'm talking about. Some people here know what I'm talking about. You, I'm not just the only one, I don't believe. So we fight, and we're fighting against God. 
And then we fight and we find ourselves miserable and everybody else around us is miserable too. Because when we're miserable, we're absolutely grumpy. Oh, y'all look too sanctimonious out here. We get, uh, we get grumpy. We worry. We become a worry wart. Drive everybody else crazy with our worries and our fears and our anxieties. We get depressed. We get frustrated and angry and, and all these things. All because it's the result of the war that's inside of us. It's not God's fault. It's our own lust that's in there. That's saying, I want to do it my way. And the war is on. And there's always casualties in war. There's always pain in war. There's always misery. Misery accompanies wars and fighting. And misery will happen when we don't give it all over to Jesus. Or we try to take it back. Verse 4 says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, an adulterer or adulteress is somebody who is, has, has changed uh, uh, relationships with their spouse. You know, they're a spouse to the husband, is a spouse to the wife, the wife's a spouse to the husband, but one of them chooses, hey, I'm going to have an affair with somebody else and my loyalty, my love and everything else is going to go away from you and be given to this person too and it commits adultery. The same word is applied toward our relationship with God. When our relationship with God is, all right, I'm trying to serve God, but I also want to serve the world too and I start doing the things of the world, we commit spiritual adultery. That's why he says, you adulteresses, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore, therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So when we want to partake of the things of the world, the desire is there because it's inside of us as the flesh, I mean the human, we're still human. But also the presence of God is there because we've asked Jesus to save us, saying don't do that. And we have to make a choice who's going to be our friend. Who's going to be my friend? Who am I going to have friendship with? Who am I going to have the relationship with? Who is going to be the one that's there with me and I identify myself with? Are we going to be a friend of the world? And do what the world wants to do with all of its sin and its pain and its guilt and its shame? Are we going to be a friend of God and do what he wants to do and receive his peace and his joy and his direction and his love and his support on the journey? If we choose to be a friend of the world, we choose to be an enemy with God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? In other words, there's one translation that says something to this point. The spirit that dwells within us jealously desires for us to be his own. The spirit inside of us is jealous for us to be our, his own and nobody else can have us. The Spirit of God wants us. The Spirit of God desires that relationship and is as, as, as our God is our Father, the Father is saying, this is my kid. And I'm jealous. And I don't want them, want them to have the friends in the world. I don't want the world to be its friends. And so he's fighting for us. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's a friend that will fight for you. And he's a friend that's got your back at all times. And he's a friend that will tell you the truth, even if you don't want to hear it. He'll tell you the truth. And he's a friend that wants the very best for you. The so-called friends of the world 
will use you. And they'll use you for what they can get, and then when everything's gone, they'll leave you high and dry. So-called friends of the world will abuse you. They'll abuse you and take advantage of you with no real concern for who you are, for your feelings, and for where your soul is going to go. And the so-called friends of the world will accuse you then. It's all your fault. They will uh, accuse you and abandon you when things go wrong. Amen. Are these what the friends of the world do? The so-called friends of the world will do these? But Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. Amen. And he never will leave us. Who do we want to be friends with? Do you want to be friends with God and have his support and his help? Or do you want to be friends with the world and have your them abuse you and accuse you and use you? So that's what God is trying to do. He's trying to protect us from that. He's trying to protect us from fair weather friends. And that's why he fights for us. That's why he's longing for us. That's why he is jealous for us. He loves you. He loves you. <laughs> He loves you. And it's an unconditional love. It's not based upon if you love me back. It's not based upon how good I am or how bad I am. He loves us anyhow. Unconditionally. Hallelujah. He loves us at all times. Even when we're struggling. Whose friends are you going to be? Friends of the world? That will use, abuse, and accuse? Or friends of God that genuinely loves you? I want to be a friend of God. Amen. Amen. I'll give you my answer. I want to be a friend of God. But listen, you can't be both. We can't be friends to both. All of the fighting and inner turmoil with God can end because he offers grace to the humble. Verse 6 says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Humbling ourselves. Humbling ourself. Myself, yourself, self. Humbling it and saying, stop trying to be in charge. You're not in charge, Todd. You're not in charge. You're not in control. You'll make a mess of things. How many times have you made a mess of things? Amen. Stop trying to be in charge. Stop trying to be in control. Stop it. Humble yourself and realize God needs to be in control. And God is the only one that can do it. That requires humility on our part because otherwise we're prideful and we think we can do everything and anything. We think we're Superman. We think we're whatever the characters are in Avenger and all that kind of stuff that's going on right now. I want to tell you about a movie you need to go watch. It's called Breakthrough. You need to go watch that. That's all I'm going to say about it. You need to watch it. It's in the movie theaters right now. If you have somebody that is wondering and questioning about miracles and God, who he is, you need to go see that. I'll just, I'll give my endorsement to it. But he gives grace, grace to the humble. Pride is ugly. 
Now, it tries to look pretty, but it's ugly. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. <laughs> That's what pride is, putting lipstick on a pig. That's all it is. <laughs> it's still ugly with pretty pink lipstick. <laughs> Because it wants to show an image. It wants to be bigger. It wants to be better. It wants to be the best. It wants to override. It wants to, it wants to overturn. It wants to be in charge. Pride does. And pride is ugly because it defies God. It wants the very best to satisfy our inner lust. But pride is sin. And the only way to get rid of pride is we have to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves. And when we do that, He gives us grace and more grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor in our lives. We don't deserve it, but He gives it to us because He loves us. Grace is that supernatural divine power that comes inside of our lives to help us to be able to live the Christian life with victory. Grace. God's grace. And His grace is sufficient for us. Where we're weak, He's strong. And we all have weaknesses. That's where those lusts are. Warring. Desiring. Rising up. Grace is what helps us to stay true to God. Grace, the grace of God, helps us to stay true to God. Gives us that strength, that, that power that we need. And His grace is sufficient. We don't need anything else. His grace is sufficient for us. But we only receive it when we humble ourselves. We can't try to keep in charge. We can't try to keep being in control. We cannot try to keep having all of the authority or taking some of the authority or usurping authority of God for ourselves. We have to humble ourselves before God. Verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. So we have to come to that place. If we are in a struggle, if you're warring inside, if you are if you are dealing with your own self and you're dealing with God's conviction and his power in our lives, you've got to humble yourself. You've got to submit yourself to God. Give him a hundred percent. Give him those things that's causing you problems. Give him your weaknesses. He can take them. He can handle them. He's God. He has broad shoulders. He can carry it. His yoke is easy. His burden's light. Okay? He can handle it. He can handle our insecurities. He can handle our fears. He can handle our anxiety. He can handle our doubt. He can handle our worries. He can handle anything and everything. God is God and all-powerful and almighty. Amen. But we have to submit ourselves to God. Submit ourselves totally to Him, giving Him all. And then we've got to resist the devil because the devil's going to keep on coming. He's stupid enough to think he can win. And maybe he's not so stupid sometimes. Because if we fail to keep submitting ourselves to God, he does start winning. If he didn't think he had some chance, he wouldn't fight. Think about that. If the devil didn't think he had some chance of destroying us and getting us back, he wouldn't fight against us so bad. You know, in a new convert life especially, the devil is going to fight and going to fight, going to fight, going to fight because he knows that you're not as strong yet. Your faith is new. It's your baby. Who does he go about trying to destroy? Those that are weak. It's not anything to, you know, it's just we're weaker. 
That's why it's important to have the covering of the church. That's why it's important to be in church and surround yourself with godly people and godly influence and and to read the Bible and to pray and, and to become stronger because if not, then the devil just keeps coming at you and at you and at you and at you. You find that war and that war and that war and that war and eventually you can just say, I give up and quit. But listen, what we have to gain and what we've already received as a believer is not something you want to give up. And everything you may lose for what you will gain will be worth it. That's hard to deal with, especially as we are here still in the flesh, still in the world. We're not of the world, but we're in the world, and we're still having to deal with the world and the things of the world and the temptations, and the devil's still active and still doing things, and, and the flesh and the inner struggle is still there from time to time, and we still have that going on, and it makes it difficult. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. If you'll yield yourself, if I yield myself, if I submit myself to him. Submit yourself to God. That's first, 100%. Resist the devil. No time for you, devil. You've come talking to the wrong person. That's what we got to start doing. Sometimes what we do is don't we? We try to push and we say, hey, we're still in, well, yeah, maybe, yeah, no, yeah, no. That's that struggle. It's where we're trying to say, come on, and trying to hold him off. When you submit yourself to God, holy. And Jesus shows up the, at the door when the devil comes knocking. And he fights the battle for us. And he is. The battle's not yours. I think we talked about that a couple of weeks ago with Jehoshaphat. The battle does not belong to us. It belongs to him. When Jesus comes to the door and we've submitted ourselves to him and we're saying, no, I'm not going to listen to the devil. We're resisting him. Not going to give you a foot more in my life then what will he do eventually he will tuck his tail and he will flee from you now when i think of flee i don't think of just well okay i'll just go my way i think of when the light turns on and cockroaches start going And they start hiding and they start going over this way. Because the devil knows he's defeated. And he will flee from you. When you submit yourself to God and you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise because the power of God is inside of you to be able to be an overcomer over the devil. Whose friend are you going to be? Who are you going to fight against? God? The devil? Who are you going to fight against? Who is going to prevail? Think about this. Who's going to prevail in the end? Satan's going to be bound a thousand years. And then after a thousand years, he's going to be loose for a season. And then he's going to be kicked out and thrown into a pit, an endless pit. And I don't ever read about them anymore after that. (laughs) But I do read about those who are the redeemed of God. (laughs) And I read about them being in a place that is going to be glorious. I read about us being the bride of Christ and the marriage celebration that's going to take place. I read about a place where he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. Those tears you may be shedding now, one of these days, he's going to take his divine hand, that nail-scarred hand, and he's going to wipe away all those tears. For the former things are passed away. Hallelujah. 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 
Is it going to be worth it? Absolutely, it will be worth it. It's worth the fight, the good fight of faith, to keep pressing on and to keep submitting ourselves unto God. Hallelujah. But we have to come to that place, and we have to do that if we want peace. If we want to be effective, if we want to fulfill God's purpose and plan for our lives as a believer, we have to come to that place of full submission. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves constantly struggling, constantly frustrated, miserable. I've seen Christians through the years that look like they've been eating briars. They never smile. They don't have any joy inside of them. Do you know why? Because they've not submitted themselves to God. They're trying to fight the fight themselves, and they're lost, and they become frustrated and discouraged, and just, hmm, move me if you can, God. Well, I'll tell you what, God can move you. (laughs) God can still reach down, and He can still get a hold of you, and He can still change your life and turn it around if you'll let Him. He still wants to be your friend. He wants to be your best friend. People who living in fear and anxiety and depression and worry and frustration and guilt and shame and condemnation and offense, easily offended and regrets and hurting others and themselves are all manifestation of somebody who is absolutely miserable. Somebody who is constantly struggling as a believer. Trying to stay in control and keep finding out I'm losing every time. Just give all. Just stop it. Stop it. Just stop trying to be God because you're not. Just stop thinking that the world can satisfy every desire that you have because it can't. Just stop thinking that you can do things that's wrong and it'll be all right because it won't be. Stop it. And submit yourself to God. Fully. Fully to Him. Stop the struggling against Him. Verses 8 through 10 says, Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he says, okay, if you start drawing near to me, I'm going to draw near to you. You've got to make the first step. Make the first step. I'm right here. I didn't leave. I didn't go anywhere. You make a step back to me, I'll make steps towards you. You make steps toward me, I'll make steps towards you. You draw close to me. If it's in your heart, it's in my heart. If you draw close to me, I'm not going to force myself upon you. If you draw nigh to me, I'll draw draw nigh to you. And cleanse our hands of the sins and the unrighteous acts. Give them to Jesus. Lord, here are my hands. They're dirty. They're dirty. Give me clean hands. Clean hands. Lord, cleanse my hands. Wash them. Wash them with the water of your word. Wash them with the blood. Wash them and purify them. Clean my hands. And purify our hearts. My heart has been longing for after this, after this, after this, and it's gotten dirty. It's tainted. Purify my heart, Lord. Purify my heart. And Lord, help me to stop being double-minded. And trying to do this and trying to do that. Trying to love you and love the world. Then it goes on to say, be afflicted. That's not pleasant, is it? And mourn. And weep. And let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Wow. 
In other words, he's saying, don't take this lightly and don't count it as a joke. This is the real thing. And I'm looking for godly sorrow. I'm looking for you to really be sorry, God is saying, for truly sinning against me. Not just to get help and to rescue you out of your trouble, but to be sorry that you sinned against the holy God that created you. The one that can destroy your life for eternity. Being truly sorry. Get the smile off our face. Take the lightheartedness out, out, out of us. And truly be repentant and sorrowful. Because if you want to have peace, then repentance must be accompanied with godly sorrow. And then turn those things over that your lusts want to try to give you joy and surrender them with, the, with repentance. And let the heaviness of the weight of the sin be real to us. Serving God is, is, is the major decision. It's the most important decision that anybody ever makes while they're, while they're alive. Am I going to, am I going to give my life over to Christ or am I not? It's the single most important decision a person makes from birth till death. And when given the choice, and God does give us a choice because we don't have to, but when given the choice, we need to choose Christ. We need to choose and we need to take it seriously that when I am being saved, when I'm giving my life to Christ, and listen, there are sometimes there are people that come to church and they go to church and they go through the religious motions, but they've never given their life completely to Christ. Let me tell you something. That's playing church. That doesn't give you credit in heaven. What writes your name in heaven is faith in Jesus Christ. Period. Verse 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. The key, the key to all of it is humility. The key is not trying to stay in control, but rather surrendering it all to the Lord Jesus. And I am a firm believer. I have been a Christian for several years. I have known people who have been Christians and have left this life. I have spoken over some of them in their funerals. I've had family members that have professed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I am a firm believer that he who has begun a good work in you shall complete it. That you starting out in this journey with Christ and you keeping yourself submitted to Christ all along the way, one of these days, we're going to leave this life and we will leave it victoriously. Amen? Hallelujah. We will leave it with a shout. Amen? Knowing that we have one, not of our own selves, but because Jesus has won. Jesus triumphed over death, hell, and the grave. We talked about that last Sunday. He's still the same Jesus today. Death still has no hold over us. And when I leave this world, by the grace of God, by submitting myself to Him, and stop fighting, fighting against him. One of these days, this race will be over. 
and going to cross over. <laughs> we were talking about it the other night in Bible study. I've never died before. So death, to me, is something I've never experienced. And, to, and for us as humans, it's the final. It's final. It is. Just think about it. It's final. It's not another chance to do anything. There's not a chance to go say I love you or anything like that anymore. There's not a chance to say forgive me. There's not a chance to say forgive me, Lord. It's final. As, long, as far as this part of life goes. This part. But the soul never dies. <laughs> what I spoke about when I, we were said, then sings my soul. I could feel something jumping up inside of me. I could. Leaping up inside of me. That was my soul inside of me. Saying, I want to go to that place. I want to go to that place. And you know what? By His grace, I am going. Hallelujah. And by His grace, you can go too. Amen. Hallelujah. One of these days. One of these days. Just keep on holding on. Keep on submitting yourself to Christ. <laughs> keep on keeping on. Amen. For one of these days, we'll hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. And we'll be able to spend eternity with Him throughout forever and ever. And amen. Hallelujah. i got one more passage of Scripture and then I'll be finished. In Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's the ones that's already gone on. They've already said, I've made it. <laughs> They've already heard Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. So great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Stop the struggle. Stop the fighting. Submit yourself 100% over to Christ. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's made it. And he's still victorious. He still rules. He still reigns. And I can say he's ruling and reigning in my heart today. Praise God. I've not always been faithful, but he has. I've struggled from time to time, but he's always brought me back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did I get chastened? Did I get a spanking? Yeah, I got a God spanking before. And He still corrects me, and He still corrects you, and He still loves us. And if He didn't love us, He wouldn't do that. But He does love us. And He's cheering for us. And He's, he's there for us. And He's saying, you can make it. And by His grace, we will make it. Amen? We will make it. Will you stand with me today? By His grace, we will make it. Tell that to your neighbor. By His grace. We will make it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Keep looking to Him. Lay aside the weights, all the stuff that we pick up, all the junk that we pick up along the way. Lay aside the sins that does so easily beset us. They trip us up too many times. We need to get rid of them. And let us run the race with patience. Patiently. Enduring. Patience. Patience. I've not made it yet. And I don't know when I'm going. But i got to be patient. Don't give up along the way. Amen? Don't give up along the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Jesus, for the difference you've made in my life. For the difference of how you changed my life and turned my life completely around. For the difference that you've made in so many people's lives. So many within this room. So many that are watching today. So many that are in other churches today. So many in other nations today that are worshiping you, Lord. You have made the difference. Hallelujah. You've made the difference and you still make the difference. 
you're not dead, you're still alive. You still make the difference in our lives today. You still make the difference. You still give us victory. You still give us hope. You still fill our hearts with peace and love and joy. You still overflow us with your goodness, Lord. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. (laughs) And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being my father. Thank you for being our Savior, but also thank you for being our Lord in our lives. Rule and reign in us, Lord. We know that you will not lose one that's given to you. You prayed to the Father that you would not lose one that was given to you. I believe it that not one of us will be lost that you have taken. Lord, help us to submit ourselves to you daily. Help us to not try to fulfill the lusts of our flesh and the desires and the pride that's in our heart. Help those things to be crucified. Help us to take up our cross daily and follow you. Help us to keep our focus upon you, Jesus, because you are the finish line. You're the one that started us in the race, and you are the finish line. You're the one that we will slap hands with, so to speak. Give it a high five. Hallelujah. Because we made it. And then you'll come and embrace us (laughs) and put crowns on our head. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. But we'll be able to turn to you and say, no, Lord, it wasn't me. It was all you, and we'll be able to cast the crowns to your feet and to bow down and worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the only one who did it, the only one who could pay the price for our sins, the only sacrifice that could be made, the spotless blood of the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, for every person, Lord. I pray, God, if there's anybody here struggling today, Lord, struggling in their faith, still struggling. They've, they've given, but then they take back. They give a little bit, but they never have given all. Lord, let today be the day of total surrender and humility, of acknowledging I can't do this by myself, but, Lord, I give it all to you. All of it belongs to you, Lord. You can do with it. You be Lord of this, Lord of this area of my life, Lord of this situation. God, I turn it over to you. I've been trying to do this on my own accord, and it's not working. I give it to you, Lord. And God, make the difference now in people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As they play something today, if you want to come and pray, we'll pray with you. Come today. Let the Lord make a difference in your life. Let your day be turned instead of misery, instead of struggle, instead of turmoil. Let it be turned to joy and peace and hope in Christ today. Amen. Will you come? Jesus, I surrender.
Anyone else need prayer? How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior.
Praise God. She just rededicated her life to the Lord right now. Will you praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Give him praise, church. Praise God. Praise God. You know what just happened in her life? The devil just fleed. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. God. She submitted herself to God. Praise She's resisted. The devil said, I'm going to go to that altar. I'm going to give my life. And the devil just ran from her. Hallelujah. He'll do the same for whosoever will, whoever else needs prayer. God's working in this place right now. We're not going to rush it. We're going to have baptism here in just a f- whenever. But God's still moving in this place. You just continue to praise and praise. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God, 
Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust in. Praise God. Anyone else want prayer before we transition to the baptism time? Those that are going to be baptized, if you want to go ahead and get ready, I'm going to get ready also. We'll uh, continue to praise and worship. Pardon? Oh, we're going to do a video? We're going to do a video, so everybody just have a seat and uh, let the Lord minister to you, and, and uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes.
it's always a privilege to be able to baptize people. You know, that's that's one of that's part of the Great Commission. You know, you get baptized in that. Um, and so I'm honored to be able to baptize those that are going to be baptized today. And Sadie is going to, is Kaylin going to be? There she is. Okay. Come on, Kaylin. Anybody else want to be baptized today? Yeah, you got it. He raised his hand. Blessings upon her, God, as she has taken this step of obedience today in her faith and being baptized and, and now just really understanding the significance of it, that, that she is identifying herself with you, that you are her Lord and you are her Savior. You died for her and she's given her life to you and, and, and she's no longer the same person, but she's dead to her sins and alive in Christ. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for her and I pray, God, that you just bless her and let her be a blessing to others. Let her fulfill your calling and purpose in her life. I pray, God, that through the obstacles that she faces from time to time, as the enemy would try to fight her, Lord, I pray, God, that you would help her to be strong, help her to be an overcomer, help her to be a light to others that are in darkness, that they can see the same Jesus is inside of her. Give her their life. Just, just move in each person's life. We give you the praise for
she really didn't understand what baptism meant. And we had asked her, do you want to be baptized? And she said, not yet. Not yet. And then she told us just recently, I want to be baptized. And uh, she's like, do you understand what it means? I don't think so. So I, I shared with her yesterday and explained it to her more. And uh, that when you're baptized, you're telling everybody. You're telling everybody out here and everybody in the world, hey, I, I, identify, I identify myself. I'm a child of God. Jesus is my Savior and my Lord, and I belong to Him. And that's what you do when you're baptized. It's like, uh, I'm dead to the old person I was. I'm not that same person. I've been born again by the Spirit of God. Just like Jesus rose from the dead, I'm a new person in Christ, and I'm going to raise from the dead someday. Amen, church? So, I have baptized my three sons daughter, and uh, I look forward to baptizing grandchildren. Father, I thank you for my daughter. I thank you, Lord, for the blessing that she is. And Lord, her, her love that she has for you and for so many people, God. And Lord, it's, it's your love that's flowing through her heart. And I just thank you, God, for that. And I pray, Lord, your blessings upon her, God, as she's making this step today. Lord, as obedient to you, knowing that you've made the change. It wasn't something mommy or daddy did, but it's something that you, our Heavenly Father, did. And she's received that in her life through faith. And I pray, Lord, your blessings upon her keeper. God, I know you got something big in store for her. I just don't know what yet. Lord, I can see already you're working in her life and you're gifting her with certain things. And I pray, Lord, that you just bless her. Let her be a light for you. Let her be used for you, God. And, Father, let her always stay true to you. And, Lord, we just bless you. Thank you for her mom, and thank you for her brothers and her grandparents, and thank you for her church family. And, and Lord, I just thank you for everything, God. Just bless her, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. want to be baptized before we, before we leave the waters. We had three others that are interested, and uh, I tell you, this week, in the latter part of the week, the enemy has fought against this, this baptismal service today. I want you to pray for the others that have expressed last week that they want to be baptized, one is struggling. I talked with them yesterday. Some others we can't get in contact with. But God knows where they are. And God knows how to get hold of them. If your baby was crying and hurting, what would you do? We can pray. We can encourage and we can do whatever it is that God would have us to do as we can. So let's pray for them, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these that have just recently given their hearts to you. I pray, God, that you would touch them. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them and protect them. And, Lord, help them to understand the significance of what they've done. And help them, Lord, to, to trust you. And, and, Lord, as they're being uh, attacked by the enemy, I pray, Lord God, that you would protect them from that. And Lord, we as a church, we as, as the people of God, rise up right now as a mighty army. 
And we declare victory over their lives. And we, we, we pray, Lord, that they will be free, completely free. Lord, and that they will be able to enjoy the blessings of their salvation. And that they will grow in their relationship with you and help us to help them. And to love them and encourage them and be a blessing to them. Father, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We love you. And why don't you fellowship with one another and uh, enjoy the day.